What's up guys, this is Heiss, and today we've got a little bit of a neat thought experiment about the way that wheel sets on the railroad interact with the track. The idea for this video came to me after the curator of rolling stock and equipment, Jeff Taylor at the Railroad Museum, asked if I would film a little bit of the number four wheel set on the 491 number four driver. Because we run in circles, literally, all day long, we're always very concerned about wheel wear at the museum, because if we run one way more than another way, one set of flanges will scrape up against the rail instead of the others. And so we wanted to really get a good understanding of what was going on in the kinematics between the wheel set and the rail itself as the engine ran around the railroad. And what I found in the video surprised me a little bit. More on that in a little bit here, but let's take a look at kind of the thought behind how wheel sets work related to track first. So here's a wheel set in orange, just sitting on a piece of track here in black. And this would be sort of what happens in straight track, where roughly where the rail is riding on the wheel set is in a pretty even middle part of the tire. You can see that the wheels are tapered i.e. the outside of the wheel is smaller than the inside of the wheel, and I've exaggerated that in this drawing for the purposes of this demonstration. But you can see on straight track, we're riding about in the middle of the tread, and the flanges have a gap between the railhead and the flange, and this is how most of the railroad works. Now, if you were to listen to the common thoughts on how railroad wheels actually work, technically, we shouldn't really need the flanges. Technically, this green wheel set with no flanges, the long tapers, should always work and should always stay on the railroad. Well, how's that going to work? There's nothing to stop it. Well, the taper acts as a sort of differential for the railroad wheel. When we start to go around a turn, the inside rail over here is going to be a sharper radius than the outside rail. Not by much, but by just enough. So that means that the inside wheel needs to cover less distance than the outside wheel. And to do so without slipping, what happens is the wheel set moves to the outside so that the outside wheel starts riding on the larger diameter, more distance per revolution, and then the inside wheel starts to ride on the smaller and smaller diameter. And theoretically, most railroad curves are broad enough that you should never come to an issue where you run out of taper. Welcome to the narrow gauge, kid. Unfortunately, that's not the truth. We have issues with flanges scraping. So, normally what you would expect in this situation, where we've got a curve like this, the train's running this way, say on the curve, we've got a section of rail, AA, right here, and we've, you can see a drawing of that section here. You can see that the if we just had one wheel set, what we would expect is exactly what we talked about. The taller portion of the wheel on the outside rail comes up and rubs in and we hit that flange that limits our motion. And then there's a gap between the flange and the rail head on the opposite wheel and the opposite wheels riding on a smaller part of the tread. What I found by studying the footage of the 491 I'm about to show you is that the opposite was true. This is what the inside wheel was doing, and this is what the outside wheel was doing. So let's get to the footage, and at the end we'll talk about why I think this is happening. So I had two GoPros with me, and I mounted them just ahead of the number four driver on either side. This is the side on the engineer's side, looking back. So this will be on the outside rail as the train is running counterclockwise today. And then this is the view for the inside rail on the fireman side of the locomotive. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can really watch what the wheel tread and the flange does versus the rail. And I'm also going to include this graphic over top of the museum so you can see what the track is doing as it goes around with the little orange arrow representing the 491. <laughs> All right, with two whistles, we're off. The brakes are released, and you can see we start to roll as we're on a downhill grade at this portion of the museum. We're barely in a curve here until we get through the first switch. There's the frog on the left side. And here come the points. And now we're on the straight track, approaching the grade crossing, which the whistle will start to blow to signal for. But you can see as we run through the straight track and all the switches, the flanges have approximately the same gap. 
Remember, the left side is our outside rail and the right side is our inside rail. And as soon as we get through the crossing, we are starting to head into the curve. And look at that! The inside flange comes up and starts to rub on the rail. And the outside rail has a huge gap between the flange and the rail. You can hear the engine starting to work decently hard as we work up the 4% grade on this side of the museum. This side's grade is shorter but steeper than the other side. Also fun to note in this shot, as you can see, little particles flying back towards the drivers. That's the sand from the number three sander. 491 has sanders located on the number one and the number three, and the sand is being kicked up by the number three driver and throwing it towards the number four. You can also see the sandy deposits on the railhead anywhere it's not shiny as well. This switch marks the top of the hill, the summit of Rogers Pass. So everything will be now downhill, more or less, until we get back to where we started off, though there is a smidge of an uphill at the upper left portion in the diagram. There's a little bit of a bowl at the top of the railroad, but still, flange is running on the inside rail. You can even see how clean the inside flange is versus how dirty the outside one is. This footage was taken midway through one day of operations, so you can see that we had already cleaned it up by having it rub up against the rail, whereas the outside had not had the same happen to it. This is now entering the steep downhill portion of this side about three and a half percent instead of four percent and you can hear the engineer take a set on the automatic and now more of the trains getting on the grade and we're coming down to the lighter grade through the station platform about a percent and a half but with more of the weight behind us pushing us you can now hear the brake shoes starting to press against the wheel as the engineer grabs a little bit of independent just to hold the locomotive back against all the cars fighting against it. And we still have the inside wheel running against the flange. There's that fence track switch and we're back on the straight track again and the gaps even out. I filmed and edited three laps of the museum, so I'm going to leave them in for you to enjoy and make your own assumptions about, but I'll let you enjoy the sounds of the railroad. I'll have the timestamps chaptered below if you want to get the explanation for why I think this is happening at the end of the video. Just feel free and stick around and watch or jump to the end and see what's up.
So here's my guess as to why the number four axle is riding on the inside rail rather than on the outside rail. So as the locomotive is running this way around this left-hand turn, remember we have a 282 Mikado type locomotive in the 491. So our lead truck is going and it starts to try and lead us through the curve, but it's a sharp curve. So we come up on that lead truck's flange. So that lead truck is trying to pull everything over this way as hard as it can from the sword equalizer up to the suspension that then runs to the boxes over the number one driver. And these little orange lines are where I think the flanges are. So the lead truck's trying to yank everything this way to lead it through the curve. 
And by the time it gets to the number one driver, there's not enough bend or give, really, to have the number one all the way up against the outside rail as well. I imagine the number one's doing exactly what the number four is doing, and that the two and three are then rubbing against the outside rail, as it's almost like we're forming three points of a circle, three points of contact. The number two and three being the start and end of the, the group's suspension, Recall from Steam Locomotives 101 and Loco 360 that our suspension is tied into pods of three. So we have the lead truck both sides and then the front two driver sets and then the rear two drivers on each side and then the trailing truck on each side are distinct. And so as such, we have three kind of interaction points along the railroad where this one is crabbed all the way over the middle interaction point is crabbed all the way over, and so is the rear. But the number ones and the number fours don't have the capability of coming that far over within their lateral and with the way that the rest of the frame of the locomotive is sitting. So that's my assumption as to why they ride on the inside rail as opposed to the outside rail. But if you have a different idea, I'd love to hear it down in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. That's going to be it for this one.